Chapter Twenty of Persuasion by Jane Austen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Judy Guinan. Sir Walter, his two daughters, and Mrs. Clay were the earliest of all their party at the rooms in the evening and as lady dalyrimple must be waited for they took their station by one of the fires in the octagon room but hardly were they so settled when the door opened again and captain wentworth walked in alone anne was the nearest to him and making yet a little advance she instantly spoke he was preparing only to bow and pass on but her gentle how do you do brought him out of the straight line to stand near her and make inquiries in return in spite of the formidable father and sister in the background their being in the background was a support to anne she knew nothing of their looks and felt equal to everything which she believed right to be done while they were speaking a whispering between her father and elizabeth caught her ear she could not distinguish but she must guess the subject and on captain wentworth's making a distant bow she comprehended that her father had judged so well as to give him that simple acknowledgment of acquaintance and she was just in time by a side glance to see a slight curtsey from elizabeth herself this though late and reluctant and ungracious was yet better than nothing and her spirits improved after talking however of the weather and bath and the concert their conversation began to flag and so little was said at last that she was expecting him to go every moment but he did not he seemed in no hurry to leave her and presently with renewed spirit with a little smile a little glow he said i have hardly seen you since our day at lyme i am afraid you must have suffered from the shock and more from its not overpowering you at the time she assured him that she had not it was a frightful hour said he a frightful day and he passed his hand across his eyes as if the remembrance was still too painful but in a moment half smiling again added the day has produced some effects however has had some consequences which must be considered as the very reverse of frightful when you had the presence of mind to suggest that benwick would be the properest person to fetch a surgeon you could have little idea of his being eventually one of those most concerned in her recovery certainly i could have none but it appears i should hope it would be a very happy match there are on both sides good principles and good temper yes said he looking not exactly forward but there i think ends the resemblance with all my soul i wish them happy and rejoice over every circumstance in favor of it they have no difficulties to contend with at home no opposition no caprice no delays the musgroves are behaving like themselves most honorably and kindly only anxious with true parental hearts to promote their daughter's comfort all this is much very much in favor of their happiness more than perhaps he stopped a sudden recollection seemed to occur and to give him some taste of that emotion which was reddening anne's cheeks and fixing her eyes on the ground after clearing his throat however he proceeded thus i confess i do think there is a disparity too great a disparity and in a point no less essential than mine i regard louisa musgrove as a very admirable sweet-tempered girl and not deficient in understanding but benwick is something more he is a clever man a reading man and i confess that i do consider his attaching himself to her with some surprise had it been the effect of gratitude had he learnt to love her because he believed her to be preferring him it would have been another thing but i have no reason to suppose it so it seems on the contrary to have been a perfectly spontaneous untaught feeling on his side and this surprises me a man like him in his situation with a heart pierced wounded almost broken fanny harville was a very superior creature and his attachment to her was indeed attachment a man does not recover from such a devotion of the heart to such a woman he ought not he does not either from the consciousness however that his friend had recovered or from other consciousness he went no farther and anne who in spite of the agitated voice in which the latter part had been uttered and in spite of all the various noises of the room the almost ceaseless slam of the door and ceaseless buzz of persons walking through had distinguished every word was struck gratified confused and beginning to breathe very quick and feel an hundred things in a moment it was impossible for her to enter on such a subject and yet after a pause feeling the necessity of speaking and having not the smallest wish for a total change she only deviated so far as to say you were a good while at lyme i think about a fortnight i could not leave it till louisa's doing well was quite ascertained 
i had been too deeply concerned in the mischief to be soon at peace it had been my doing solely mine she would not have been obstinate if i had not been weak the country round mime is very fine i walked and rode a great deal and the more i saw the more i found to admire i should very much like to see lyme again said anne indeed i should not have supposed that you could have found anything in lyme to inspire such a feeling the horror and distress you were involved in the stretch of mind the wear of spirits i should have thought your last impressions of lyme must have been strong disgust the last hours were certainly very painful replied anne but when pain is over the remembrance of it often becomes a pleasure one does not love a place the less for having suffered in it unless it has been all suffering nothing but suffering which was by no means the case at lyme we were only in anxiety and distress during the last two hours and previously there had been a great deal of enjoyment so much novelty and beauty i have travelled so little that every fresh place would be interesting to me but there is real beauty at lyme and in short with a faint blush at some recollections altogether my impressions of the place are very agreeable as she ceased the entrance door opened again and the very party appeared for whom they were waiting lady dollywimple lady dollywimple was the rejoicing sound and with all the eagerness compatible with anxious elegance sir walter and his two ladies stepped forward to meet her lady dollywimple and miss carteret escorted by mr elliot and colonel wallace who had happened to arrive nearly at the same instant advanced into the room the others joined them and it was a group in which anne found herself also necessarily included she was divided from captain wentworth their interesting almost too interesting conversation must be broken up for a time but slight was the penance compared with the happiness which brought it on she had learnt in the last ten minutes more of his feelings towards louisa more of his feelings than she dared to think of and she gave herself up to the demands of the party to the needful civilities of the moment with exquisite though agitated sensations she was in good humour with all she had received ideas which disposed her to be courteous and kind to all and to pity every one as being less happy than herself the delightful emotions were a little subdued when on stepping back from the group to be joined again by captain wentworth she saw that he was gone she was just in time to see him turn into the concert room he was gone he had disappeared she felt a moment's regret but they should meet again he would look for her he would find her out before the evening were over and at present perhaps it was as well to be asunder she was in need of a little interval for recollection upon lady russell's appearance soon afterwards the whole party was collected and all that remained was to marshal themselves and proceed into the concert room and be of all the consequence in their power draw as many eyes excite as many whispers and disturb as many people as they could very very happy were both elizabeth and anne elliot as they walked in elizabeth arm in arm with miss carteret and looking on the broad back of the dowager viscountess dollywimple before her had nothing to wish for which did not seem within her reach and anne but it would be an insult to the nature of anne's felicity to draw any comparison between it and her sisters the origin of one all selfish vanity of the other all generous attachment anne saw nothing thought nothing of the brilliancy of the room her happiness was from within her eyes were bright and her cheeks glowed but she knew nothing about it she was thinking only of the last half hour and as they passed to their seats her mind took a hasty range over it his choice of subjects his expressions and still more his manner and look had been such as she could see in only one light his opinion of louisa musgrove's inferiority an opinion which he had seemed solicitous to give his wonder at captain benwick his feelings as to a first strong attachment sentences begun which he could not finish his half averted eyes and more than half expressive glance all all declared that he had a heart returning to her at least that anger resentment avoidance were no more and that they were succeeded not merely by friendship and regard but by the tenderness of the past yes some share of the tenderness of the past she could not contemplate the change as implying less he must love her these were thoughts with their attendant visions which occupied and flurried her too much to leave 
for any power of observation and she passed along the room without having a glimpse of him without even trying to discern him when their places were determined on and they were all properly arranged she looked round to see if he should happen to be in the same part of the room but he was not her eye could not reach him and the concert being just opening she must consent for a time to be happy in a humbler way the party was divided and disposed of on two contiguous benches and was among those on the foremost and mr elliot had manoeuvred so well with the assistance of his friend colonel wallace as to have a seat by her miss elliot surrounded by her cousins and the principal object of colonel wallace's gallantry was quite contented anne's mind was in a most favourable state for the entertainment of the evening it was just occupation enough she had feelings for the tender spirits for the gay attention of the scientific and patience for the wearisome and had never liked a concert better at least during the first act towards the close of it in the interval succeeding an italian song she explained the words of the song to mr elliot they had a concert bill between them this said she is nearly the sense or rather the meaning of the words for certainly the sense of an italian love song must not be talked of but it is as nearly the meaning as i can give for i do not pretend to understand the language i am a very poor italian scholar yes yes i see you are i see you know nothing of the matter you have only knowledge enough of the language to translate at sight these inverted transposed curtailed italian lines into clear comprehensible elegant english you need not say anything more of your ignorance here is complete proof i will not oppose such kind politeness but i should be sorry to be examined by a real proficient i have not had the pleasure of visiting in camden place so long replied he without knowing something of miss anne elliot and i do regard her as one who is too modest for the world in general to be aware of half her accomplishments and too highly accomplished for modesty to be natural in any other woman for shame for shame this is too much flattery i forget what we are to have next turning to the bill perhaps said mr elliot speaking low i have had a longer acquaintance with your character than you are aware of indeed how so you can have been acquainted with me only since i came to bath excepting as you might hear me previously spoken of in my own family i knew you by report long before you came to bath i had heard you described by those who knew you intimately i have been acquainted with you by character many years your person your disposition accomplishments manner they were all present to me mr elliot was not disappointed in the interest he hoped to raise no one can withstand the charm of such a mystery to have been described long ago to a recent acquaintance by nameless people is irresistible and anne was all curiosity she wondered and questioned him eagerly but in vain he delighted in being asked but he would not tell no no some time or other perhaps but not now he would mention no names now but such he could assure her had been the fact he had many years ago received such a description of miss anne elliot as had inspired him with the highest idea of her merit and excited the warmest curiosity to know her anne could not think of no one so likely to have spoken with partiality of her many years ago as the mr wentworth of montford captain wentworth's brother he might have been in mr elliot's company but she had not courage to ask the question the name of anne elliot said he has long had an interesting sound to me very long has it possessed a charm over my fancy and if i dared i would breathe my wishes that the name might never change such she believed were his words but scarcely had she received their sound than her attention was caught by other sounds immediately behind her which rendered everything else trivial her father and lady dalywimple were speaking a well-looking man said sir walter a very well-looking man a very fine young man indeed said lady dalywimple more air than one often sees in bath irish i dare say no i just know his name a bowing acquaintance wentworth captain wentworth of the navy his sister married my tenant in somersetshire the croft who rents kellynich before sir walter had reached this point anne's eyes had caught the right direction and distinguished captain wentworth standing among a cluster of men at a little distance as her eyes fell on him his seemed to be withdrawn from her it had that appearance it seemed as if she had been one moment too late and as long as she dared observe he did not look again but the performance was recommencing and she was forced to seem to restore her attention to the orchestra and look straight forward 
when she could give another glance he had moved away he could not have come nearer to her if he would she was so surrounded and shut in but she would rather have caught his eye mr elliot's speech too distressed her she had no longer any inclination to talk to him she wished him not so near her the first act was over now she hoped for some beneficial change and after a period of nothing saying amongst the party some of them did decide on going in quest of tea anne was one of the few who did not choose to move she remained in her seat and so did lady russell but she had the pleasure of getting rid of mr elliot and she did not mean whatever she might feel on lady russell's account to shrink from conversation with captain wentworth if he gave her the opportunity she was persuaded by lady russell's countenance that she had seen him he did not come however and sometimes fancied she discerned him at a distance but he never came the anxious interval wore away unproductively the others returned the room filled again benches were reclaimed and repossessed and another hour of pleasure or of penance was to be sat out another hour of music was to give delight or the gapes as real or affected taste for it prevailed to anne it chiefly wore the prospect of an hour of agitation she could not quit that room in peace without seeing captain wentworth once more without the interchange of one friendly look in resettling themselves there were now many changes the result of which was favourable for her colonel wallace declined sitting down again and mr elliot was invited by elizabeth and miss carteret in a manner not to be refused to sit between them and by some other removals and a little scheming of her own anne was enabled to place herself much nearer the end of the bench than she had been before much more within reach of a passer-by she could not do so without comparing herself with miss laurels the inimitable miss laurels but still she did it and not with much happier effect though by what seemed prosperity in the shape of an early abdication in her next neighbours she found herself at the very end of the bench before the concert closed such was her situation with a vacant space at hand when captain wentworth was again in sight she saw him not far off he saw her too yet he looked grave and seemed irresolute and only by very slow degrees came at last near enough to speak to her she felt that something must be the matter the change was indubitable the difference between his present air and what had been in the octagon room was strikingly great why was it she thought of her father of lady russell could there have been any unpleasant glances he began by speaking of the concert gravely more like the captain wentworth of uppercross owned himself disappointed had expected singing and in short must confess that he should not be sorry when it was over anne replied and spoke in defence of the performance so well and yet in allowance for his feelings so pleasantly that his countenance improved and he replied again with almost a smile they talked for a few minutes more the improvement held he even looked down towards the bench as if he saw a place on it well worth occupying when at that moment a touch on her shoulder obliged anne to turn round it came from mr elliot he begged her pardon but she must be applied to to explain italian again miss carteret was very anxious to have a general idea of what was next to be sung anne could not refuse but never had she sacrificed to politeness with a more suffering spirit a few minutes though as few as possible were inevitably consumed and when her own mistress again when able to turn and look as she had done before she found herself accosted by captain wentworth in a reserved yet hurried sort of farewell he must wish her good night he was going he should get home as fast as he could is not this song worth staying for said anne suddenly struck by an idea which made her yet more anxious to be encouraging no he replied impressively there is nothing worth my staying for and he was gone directly jealousy of mr elliot it was the only intelligible motive captain wentworth jealous of her affection could she have believed it a week ago three hours ago for a moment the gratification was exquisite but alas there were very different thoughts to succeed how was such jealousy to be quieted how was the truth to reach him how in all the peculiar disadvantages of their respective situations would he ever learn of her real sentiments it was misery to think of mr elliot's attentions their evil was incalculable End of chapter twenty recording by judy guinan